We thank you, Lord, for this day. And we thank you for bringing us together for another morning, man. I mean, it's just a joy. I just get so excited on Thursday. So it's such a wonderful thing to look forward to for us to get together and have these conversations. And Lord, I just pray you will bless our time and make it satisfying, meaningful. Lord, I pray it would be revelatory. I mean, life-changing. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to continue talking to you. And I'm building off of what we have been sharing about how uh, we are overcoming unbelief, how important it is to be conscious of what it is that makes it hard for us to believe, what inhibits us, restricts us from believing. And one of the things that God has revealed is how that unbelief is not necessarily something that is evolving from some demonic source or maybe even from some uh, evil uh, source. But unbelief comes out of my humanity, it comes out of the fact that uh, I am human. It comes out of the fact that uh, there are things about me that make it hard for me to believe. Consequently, my approach must not be to rebuke necessarily um, unbelief as something that is of the devil, but to, but to address what it is about me that is causing me to have unbelief. And so I want to kind of, I guess I want to shift gears. I'm really talking about how not just overcome unbelief, but then that which is about us that facilitates belief, that makes us able to believe. And in other words, I want to talk about how God made us in a way that causes us to be fitted to believe. It's like our unique human makeup allows God to give us faith for things that he chooses to use us in. And that there are things you can believe because of the way you're constituted, because of the way that God made you. I mean, I think a lot of times you're not conscious of how amazing you are, how prolific you are in terms of how God has made you the way you are for purpose, for me. You know, I don't want you to get the wrong impression about unbelief that you over-exaggerate those things about us that make us unable to believe. There's also a lot to say for how God has made us capable of belief. And you probably don't even think about how much of a blessing you are to others and how much good comes from the way you treat people and relate to people because of the way that God made you. I mean, your life is a mission, you know that. I mean, you are where you are because God put you there. And he intentionally has you on assignment for people for situations. It's not really calling the shots. You're being moved around by a God who has put things in you that he wants to come out of you. And uh, I always regret a lot of times when I go to a funeral because I hear all these wonderful things people have to say about the person who died. I mean, I think to myself, it would be so wonderful if they could have heard those things from those people when they were alive. I mean, I wonder all of these things these people are saying about this person. Did they ever tell them that? Did they ever say to them, you know, the impact that they were having on their lives? I mean, as great as it is for other people to appreciate you, and that's really important, and I think we should take time to tell people thank you and express to people how important they are to us. First of all, because people really need that. 
Second of all, because that's a ministry you have to those people. And then, um, but let me ask you a question. How much do you appreciate yourself? I mean, I think it's equal, equally important to appreciate yourself. And that is really understand that belief comes from valuing yourself, seeing yourself as a treasure. A lot of your belief and facilitating belief comes from how you're feeling about yourself. And just like unbelief sometimes can inhibit you from believing, believing is triggered by what you believe about yourself. And I believe that you should like the way you were made. You hear me? I really believe that you should love the way you are. And the way you are is not a bad thing because God made you that way. You were created in his image. And uh, I believe a lot of unbelief comes from us being critical about ourselves and especially about things that we can't control or things that we can't change. For example, everyone should like the way they look. Do you hear me? Especially to the women, I want to say that. You should like the way you look, even as you are right now. I know you say, well, I need to do this. I need to do that. No. I think it's unbelief when you don't like the way you look. Now, I know people might have standards and they may have different ideas about what they think or the way they think you should look, but that's really irrelevant because God made you and he made you the way you are. And uh, it's an insult to him that you got an issue with that. And I don't think you should regret anything about your physical appearance and about the way God made you, you know? And if anything, I think you should relish in your own uniqueness and specialness about the way that God has made you. It's so funny. You know, you have a fingerprint that's unlike anybody else's. There's no one else that has your fingerprint, your DNA. Your DNA is so unique that if you commit a crime, if they can see fingerprint or DNA, they can trace it to you. What does that say? That says that God intended for you to be different, intended you to be unique, and intended you to be special. You know, I love that verse where David is talking about how that his thoughts toward me are can't you can't even number the thoughts that went into him creating me. What is that? Uh, Psalms 139, 14 says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and my soul knoweth right well. A New English translation says, I'm strangely and delicately formed. <laughs> Taylor translation says, Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. It's amazing to think about. The workmanship is marvelous. I was reading that and then I thought, workmanship? Whoa, workmanship. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says this. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And if you look up the word workmanship, it means handiwork, a special design to do unique things that no one else can do. Have you ever thought of yourself as being a handiwork or somebody that has a special skill, ability, that you have a special calling 
that you were put on this earth for a purpose and only you can do it. I mean, the, the time that it took to figure out exactly how God wanted you to be. You know, if you ever see like a masterpiece or something, you say to yourself, wow, that person was so detailed. They were so precise. Man, look how everything is just exactly the way it should be. You know, we we go to creation, we look at uh, a sunset or we look over some water and we like amazing, how beautiful. I said, man, God is so amazing with creation. But you know, his greatest creation was you. His greatest creation was how he made you. And you're not like anybody else. It's really sad that society tries to make us be like everybody else. But God didn't make us to be like everybody else. God made us to be distinct and to stand out. And so I really believe that what is it in us that causes us to not just not be able to believe, but I believe our uniqueness, our specialness is what facilitates our ability to believe. And that's why there's certain things that we are really confident about. I mean, we don't have no problem believing in certain kinds of things. But then there are other things that, well, we don't have a whole lot of confidence and belief in those kinds of situations. You kind of shake. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence that we're strong in some areas and weak in others. It could be that related to what kinds of things that are easier to believe and those things that are not easy for us to believe. And if that's the case, belief is the key faculty. Belief determines everything because it basically means that faith is possible in those areas where we're weak. So when we have weaknesses, we don't have to concede. All we have to do is to believe. And I think that's what Paul was talking about. We were sharing the other day about what he says in 2 Corinthians, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, my reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And it really sounds like it's by design that I have weaknesses, or as Paul calls, infirmities. It's normal and the way it should be for us to have shortcomings, incapacities, flaws, and deficiencies. That's normal. That's because we're human. And this is really weird because Paul seems to be saying that we're supposed to have faults and imperfections. You know, denying that you have weaknesses, you have faults and imperfections. It's really not true because you do. And it's like he's saying that we can concede that these things exist because that's the way we are. We're not trying to change those things. As much as what we're trying to do is see those things as an opportunity to receive more grace. I want to suggest to you that God created you in a way where you would need him. He created, he created you in a way where you can only go so far without him. God created you in a way where he intentionally means for you to draw upon him, to look for him, and to draw from him. Grace makes up for your human infirmities. And you have human infirmities. You have weaknesses. You have faults. Paul is saying God is in the business of making us aware of the, our shortages so that we will always turn to him for help. And when we talk about unbelief, we don't overcome unbelief by our willpower 
by our strength of will. I mean, it's not a question where, you know, we overcome our unbelief by concentrating more and, you know, focusing more, all this stuff people try to make you think about how you get faith that way. No, you get faith as a result of your humble access to God and looking to him to give you grace. It takes all the strain out of it. it. Takes all of the pressure out of it. it. Takes all of the beating up on yourself and feeling pressure upon yourself and frustration within yourself because you're thinking, I need to not have this unbelief. Well, instead of going through all of that, what about humbly yielding and saying, God, I need your grace because um, the areas where you're strong you know you can handle but the areas where you're weak that's where you're made strong God gives you his grace like, that for everything is covered in other words God made you in a way where there are things that you're strong that you're good at that you can handle right? It's inherently how you're constituted, how you're made. Your humor part of you makes you able to function. But I don't care who you are. He did not make you so that you're strong in all areas. He did not make you in a way where you would not have to rely on him, depend on him, access him, and uh, as a matter of fact, that is the, that's the connecting point when I become aware of my weaknesses. When I reach the end of what I can do. And when I become aware of something I cannot do, that's when he expects me to rely on him and look to him to give us, give me grace favor. So funny how the word grace really embodies so much. Actually, it's a New Testament word. You don't find the word grace in the Old Testament because before Jesus came, grace meant something other than what it came to mean in the New Testament, the New Covenant. Because grace in the New Covenant means something undeserved, something that's given when you did not have the proper payment to give an exchange. It is to be excused, to be released without merit, without cost. It's something that doesn't exist in the natural realm. And it's not possible in human relations. It's something that came and created and God made through his son, Jesus Christ. By grace, you say, it is not of yourselves. <laughs> Amen. The great blessing and improvement of the new covenant is that while in the old covenant, there was the emphasis on you doing right and serving God and obeying him so that he could bless you. In the new covenant, the emphasis is on the fact that he paid it all. And I'm really a receiver. I'm not a doer anymore. I'm a receiver. And my doing comes out of my gratitude about having received. My motivation is not to earn. My, my motivation is to express my thanksgiving, express my absolute appreciation to a God who would see fit, give me another chance. And so this is really a game changer because I'm no longer at the mercy of my own human ability and my own power. I'm not limited by what I can do for myself or by myself because grace 
is the big equalizer. Grace kicks in when I get in over my head. Do you know it's by design that you get in over your head? You know, when things are too much for you, you have grace. Grace saves the day. I mean, because of grace, I can receive more than I can get by myself, more than I could do by myself. And like I said, the natural man is trying to do everything it can for itself, but it's by design that I cannot do all that needs to be done. I have to rely on his grace. And it's such a blessing because I can do more than my human ability can afford me to do. That means I can be blessed beyond my human effort. That's really liberating. That all this pressure that I put on myself, I'm not at the mercy of my human limitations. It's like I have an extra boost that I can receive when I run out of steam. I got bonus power. I put it that way. I got bonus power when I get to the end of my human resources. It's relieving to know that the Lord is guaranteeing a support, strength, and even provision whenever we run out. Grace. <laughs> as wonderful as it is to be aware of what is lacking in us, we also need to be aware of what facilitates us, what gives us hope, confidence, belief. There is no more excuse for us not being more than conquerors or able to do exceedingly abundant above all we could ever ask or think. Why? Because of the arrival of grace. And so I kind of want to shift gears in our teaching, kind of getting us ready for the next for the next year, because, you know, in 2024, we're looking, I really believe it's a time of opportunity. Like the, he's gonna open the door in 2024. And I really believe it's gonna come down to our belief, our level of belief, our uh, intensity of belief and Laying the groundwork for belief has to do with finding it in the same source what unbelief is, and that is in us. The things about us that God has put in us to cause us to have belief. It's like you have to manage the things in you that are cause of unbelief. You need to be aware of where this unbelief is coming from, the resistance you feel in terms of belief. That's one. And then simultaneously, you have to be aware of what it is about you that allows you to facilitate belief. And they're done simultaneously. The human element is in both cases. The inner resistance to faith comes from things inside us in terms of how we're conditioned, the past experiences we've had, and our own human makeup. At the same time, the things that allow us to believe also come from the things that God has put in us, the experiences that he's had with us. It's like, it's like God has uh, equipped me for things that are happening now from experiences that he's taken me through in the past that there's this progressive move that God has been working in me and on me and that uh, what he has done for me before has set me up for where he's taken me into now. And uh, things like our personality type and our 
unique human quality, some of it even genetic that comes from our inherent individual tendencies that make us capable for things that he wants to use us for and do things in us. That when people look at us, they're like, how in the world were you able to do that? I mean, even in our own mind, we're like thinking, I can't do that. But that's where the belief is coming. Because the, because the expansion of my ability to believe is the expansion of my capacity to do. My functionality is tied to my believability. My growth in how I think dictates the degree to which I can, I can operate, I can do. And uh, it's like my proficiency in terms of being able to do things is tied not just to, not just to, uh, not just to the difficulty of the situation, but what actually becomes natural for me. I have been created for this. I love what Jesus said to Pilate. He said, for this cause came I into the world that I might die and sacrifice my life in mankind. Wow, that was a moment. That was a moment when his human side came together with his spirit side. You know, you're coming to a place where you're going to realize, whoa, for this cause. I mean, that's, that's when you get on the same page with God. That's when the confusion all of a sudden dissipates. When you realize, I've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is when I'm not worried about myself and about my situation and what people, I'm like, oh, we on the same page, Lord. <laughs> oh, I get it. Wow. Oh, so this is what this was about. Everybody should come to that point. And if I have my way, and if God has his way, you're going to come to that point. And uh, it's nothing for you to do certain things. And while it may be challenging, it's not a struggle for you. Because you know why. You know why God brought you and made you. And uh, so I believe... Understanding yourself is critical to you learning how to believe. I believe that your access to God is tied to your understanding of God's creating you the way he's created you. And so your appreciation for yourself in terms of how you are and even your journey, your narrative. I mean, you really have to realize that when you look back on where you were and what God has done and how he has brought you, there's got to be an element where you realize, oh, man, this all makes sense. You know, all the confusion and believing comes from a lack of awareness, self-awareness of who we are. I really believe that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth because truth makes us free. And what enables you to have belief, as I've told you already before, I'm repeating myself, but what enables you to have belief is when you operate in the truth. And let's define truth as accurate reality. It's possible to have inaccurate reality. That's not truth. But truth is, truth is the correct perception of things. Truth is the way things actually are. When you get truth, right, you have clarity. And clarity is the basis 
of certainty. There cannot be certainty where there is not clarity. And so confidence comes from explicitness. When things are explicit, then you can be confident. When you understand there is the opportunity for sureness, that's when you can have strong conviction, when you're sure of something. Because truth is the direct product of clear-mindedness. I got a term for it, brightness of insight. <laughs> I made that up. Brightness of insight. The power with which you extract the word comes from the accurate comprehension of the word that you receive. It's not just getting a word. That word has to be understood, comprehended, grasped. Meaning must literally shoot through the darkness and literally light up. You gotta have an aha moment. Oh, so that's what that means. <laughs> the distinctness of thought provides the opportunity for sharp discernment of truth. You know what? I'm going to give you this handout. I'm going to give you this handout because these things you got to think about for a minute. But I ain't got time to stop. I got to keep going, all right? Because I got to get to a place, all right? But faith is an experience where we can have in God where we become aware of his realness, his existence, his, his authenticity. Our interaction with God is always the result of our belief in him. Consequently, unbelief is the greatest liability. Unbelief is our greatest asset. I told you that before. And as I was sharing over the last several weeks, addressing our unbelief is the key to key element to our deliverance. As a matter of fact, deliverance at its root is being freed from the limitation of bondage and the bondage of unbelief. Think of unbelief as bondage. Okay, they're the same thing. When we have bondage, it's always the result of unbelief, okay? And there may be a myriad of things that could be a source of bondage in your life. And bondage can take a whole lot of different forms. But all forms of bondage are caused by one thing. And that one thing is unbelief, failure to believe disbelieving in the truth. That's why when you read the Gospels, Jesus emphasized faith so much because that's the root, okay? He emphasized faith because ridding ourselves of unbelief is the pathway to freedom. You're not any freer then you're bound by unbelief. And as I said, what makes this complicated is that unbelief is not an external thing, but unbelief is the result of our human makeup. We have unbelief because we're human and that's the way God made us. And too often we've been taught that our unbelief is a failure of discipline or we're not being vigilant enough or we've been led to believe that unbelief comes from our lack of being devout or human effort, we have unbelief because we're not praying enough or we're not um, doing enough. We're not engaging in enough spiritual activities to rid ourselves from it. But what I'm learning is that unbelief is more a function of the way I'm humanly constituted. It's more a result of how I'm made. Consequently, the key to addressing unbelief is having a better understanding of what is causing me to have unbelief. In other words, let me put this one. The Holy Spirit is revealing truth about us so that we can better manage the things about us. That unbelief is 
characteristic of us. We all have our own specific form of unbelief. That's why we all need a personal revelation by the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what it is about us. We cannot discover what's with us by looking at another person or by even another person necessarily knowing exactly what's wrong with us, okay? The Holy Spirit has to have an individual personal conversation with us and reveal to us. And so a lot of the teaching about faith is false because it teaches us to view unbelief as something that's wrong with us as opposed to something that is the way we are to be. A lot of so-called Christian thinking puts us at odds with ourselves and that we spend a lot of time wrestling with things that we perceive are the problem when those things are a part of what makes us what we are. And so in other words, the power of belief is what is that when I believe in the truth, I can then be rid of the dominance of the flesh. And then only can I precisely identify what is it about me that makes it difficult for me to believe, consequently causing me to sin. Sin is a byproduct of my humanity. You understand? It's not something that is, is separate from my humanity. It is a byproduct of my humanity. And if my flesh is given control and power, it's going to sin. All right? But if I, if I operate by the spirit and if I live in truth, I can be aware, conscious, and unbelief cannot, cannot take me down the road of being disconnected from God. And so funny because, you know, unbelief is not sin itself, but it is the aspects of our humanity that make us inclined to sin. And uh, so, Guess what I'm saying is that spirituality is not focusing so much on sin, but focusing on unbelief. I mean, you look at the Gospels, you look at Jesus. Jesus did not spend a lot of time talking about sin. He spent most of his time talking about unbelief. Why? Because the application of God's word is what allows us to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. It's when the word cuts down between the divine son and soul spirit and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And that was his approach to not be condemning and lambasting people for having sin in their lives. His emphasis was on addressing their unbelief and promoting their belief. He ministered to people's tendencies and inherent practices they displayed. He addressed evil patterns, bad habits that they had developed. He rarely have ever made a big deal about people's faults and their weaknesses. He focused on, on all, us all getting, he focused on getting them to believe the truth so they could believe in God and believe in what was true, operate in the right reality, live in a way that was appropriate. In other words, Jesus was giving us light so we could have clarity and understanding. He was liberating us from things that kept us miserable, lost, and confused. Jesus was all about getting us in a relationship with God where we could fully experience God completely as our source, as our strength, as our means, most of all, as our life. And so everything starts to make sense when you realize it's about the Holy Spirit revealing to me and showing me What's going on with me? <laughs> Why am I the way I am? And really be becoming all that God created and intended for me to be. That a better understanding of God comes as a result of the Holy Spirit giving me a better understanding of what's happening with me. That's where deliverance is. 
That's where liberation comes from. That's where freedom comes. Let, let me explain something to you. The Holy Spirit does not liberate you by changing your situation. Do you hear me? Stop praying for a change in your situation. I know you really want things to change because you think I got to rebuke all the negative things that are going on in my situation. That's not what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is using this situation to change you. When you are converted, Satan desires to if you like, wait, but, but, but I pray for you. I pray for you that your faith will not fail. I'm not praying for you that you overcome the situation or that you win despite the situation. Okay. Praying for conversion. What's conversion? Conversion is an inner change within you. Okay. It's so important because a lot of times we're thinking the situation is about these people when really it's about God challenging some false assumptions you're making about yourself. That's the cause of the fears. That's the source of the uncomfortableness. Stop trying to escape people that make you feel uncomfortable. God's allowing you to be around people who make you feel uncomfortable so that he can address what it is in you that causes them to make you feel insecure, make you feel uncomfortable. You say, well, I need to get away from these people. Well, if you get away from those people, there's some more people that are like that that are going to show up. Go ahead, leave the job. Go ahead to the next one. Go on to the next one. When you get there, you go find some people just like that because it's not escaping the people. It's escaping the unbelief, the bondage that's associated. And believe it or not, that's what God is addressing. I mean, it's like the children of Israel went around and around and around, they never got it because they thought it was about the land. They thought it was about the destination. No, it's not. It's about the lesson. It's about learning something here so that you can go to the destination. You're not going until you change. What should I say? Come in the awareness of what the real source of bondage, or should I say unbelief is. Like the Holy Spirit is challenging and addressing some erroneous beliefs that you have about yourself. I mean, he, he wants you to know you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He wants you to discover all that you are capable. He wants you to learn how to value yourself because he values you. And he has great plans for you. I think so often we think it's the challenge that we face. And that's what makes us exaggerate the opposition. That's what makes us feel overwhelmed. That's what makes us assume this is too much. But Paul said, when I am weak, he said, then I am strong. In other words, it's by design that I get to a place where I have to, I, I need his grace because that is the source of my unbelief. I think this is more than it is. That's the problem. And so the correction, as we've been telling you for three years, is in how I think and what I think. The power is in the revelation of truth that exposes the falsehood and lies that have been planted in my mind. 
When you have a lack of clarity, you cannot help but have doubts. When you're unsure about what you're seeing, you can't help but be unsure. And when you're unsure, what you're up against, it's hard to be certain about the outcome. And when you're lost in your mind, you can't find your way to navigate through a situation. The problem you have with certain people is because they trigger your unbelief of the problem you have within yourself. So don't focus on them. They are foolish. I'm not denying that. They're crazy. It's, un, it's unfair that they act like that or treat you that way. But victory and deliverance comes when what you believe about yourself and what you believe about what God has done in you, done for you, done through you, makes their treatment not weaken you or affect you. That's when you have passed the test. That's the purpose of this. This is this is what, where God is trying to take you. Why? Because now you're on the same page as he is. And this is what's going to equip you for your next assignment. It's time to stop going around in circles. It's time to arrive. And when the Holy Spirit shows you what's going on in you, all of a sudden, you see a path for how you can navigate to the next place. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe we're going to the next place. The next place is the next level, the next assignment, the next uh, challenge, the, 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 the improved, or should we say advanced stage. That's what all of this has been about, equipping us and preparing us for it to not just be about survival anymore, but about usefulness, about productivity, about accomplishing, about stepping into a place of usefulness. I mean, you will be content just to get out of trouble, but this really isn't about getting out of trouble. This is really about the equipping of you to fulfill your life calling, to understand what you were put on this earth to do. <laughs> Listen, I ain't denying you doing some good stuff, but you have not stepped into your destiny. There is a place of usefulness, a place of, uh, of, of God maximizing why he brought you this way why he took you through what you went through. Amen. Thank God you got out of Egypt. Thank God that he preserved you through the wilderness. Thank God you arrived in the new land. But let's not think that's what this was. That's all the journey. The destination is for you to be a people that could reveal God to the world. And you can't reveal God when you're confused about yourself. Are y'all following me today? See, when you get what you need to do internally, you no longer need from anyone, for anyone to do anything for you. That's when you reach the point where all you need is God. <laughs> You ain't there yet, but you're getting there. I'm talking about all that you need is God. You are absolutely independent of what anybody does or does not do. I'm talking about just getting to a place where it just doesn't matter how things are going. What's going on? The bottom line is all 
you need is God. I'm saving as a general rule. Stop waiting around for people to do what they're supposed to do. That may never happen. If you're waiting for people to do what they should do so you can, you know, I mean, it may happen. I, I'm not going to just that shit is. Yeah, I guess people can't change. People do that, you know. But if you're dependent on them, this isn't about you getting dependent on them. Or even God doing a miracle so that they can not be a problem for you. That's not what this is about. This is about you coming to a place like Paul said. Whatever state I am, therewith I'm content. Or I'm completely independent. I'm independent of my circumstance. I'm independent of people. I made an adjustment where all my help comes from the Lord. I made an adjustment where he is absolutely all I need. I mean, some of you are going through some things right now. I mean, how much time I got? Oh, shoot. Let me prophesy for a minute. You know, so some of you are going through some things that you're just hoping that things could get better. You're really counting on God. Just, you know, addressing some things. You just think it's a temporary thing. I just need to get through this little stretch here. <laughs> I need for things to fall in place. You ever need things to fall in place? Has things ever fell in place? <laughs> God, if you could just... If you could just do this, I mean, I know I'll be fine after that. No, you won't. <laughs> I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just saying, stop basing your hope on things, getting back to the way it was or the way you, it, you want it to be. Or this happens, that happens. I need you to concentrate on just getting to a place where I can be completely content with the way things are. No, Pastor D, God, this ain't God's will for me to be in those situations like this. And this needs to happen. Okay, go ahead. Make my, do what you want, man. I'm just saying that this really isn't about changing things the way they should be. It's about you changing the way you are your approach I mean relief's not coming by things falling into place okay all that energy you spend in trying to bind and loosen <laughs> I want a tranquil peace to come over you I want a total confidence to come over you I want you to reach a point where you're absolutely at ease as things are present constantly, because the change is not coming from the situation. The change is coming from how you are. You were created to thrive, not because everything's perfect, but because you have a connection and a relationship with God that affords you the ability to enter into his rest. You notice, I'm out of time. You notice the promised land was not the promise. The land wasn't the promise. The promise was when I get to the land, I can enter into his rest. The rest is not land. The rest is a place in God. Man out. I'm going to send you a copy of this, okay? Thank you, sir.